Okay, so first of all, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to present our data here. So my name is Christian Gutekunst and I'm currently still um, at the University of Kiel. However, from April on, I will be at the University of Kassel and, and head the group of bioenergetics and food autotrophs. Um, so today my talk will be about glycolytic shunts that replenish the Kelvin Benson cycle as anaplerotic reactions and transition states in the cyanobacterium synecocystis. So um, this slide is just a reminder to the players of the central carbon metabolism in cyanobacteria and also in plants, of course. So what you see here is first of all the light reaction of photosynthesis, which starts uh, with the splitting of water, and then you get ATP and NADPH out here. They are then both used in the Calvin Benson cycle for the CO2 fixation and carbohydrates are formed. And this is kind of the, the autotrophic or the anabolic part of the metabolism. And then this carbohydrate can be broken down by different glycolytic routes to pyruvate. So the pyruvate can then be fed into the TCA cycle where it's decarboxylated and um, yields ATP and NADPH and NADH. And this is then fed into the respiratory chain. So electrons are brought back to oxygen and, and water is formed. So this, these are kind of the players of the central carbon metabolism. Um, what we are looking at is basically the interplay of these glycolytic roots um, with photosynthesis and, and the process of, of carbon fixation in, in cyanobacteria. Um, so there are three different glycolytic roots in, in cyanobacteria and also in plants, We're starting with glucose. So first of all, it's the EMP pathway, which is shown in, in red here, which is also often called glycolysis. Um, then you see in blue the oxidative pentose phosphate pathway in, in blue here, and then the third root, which is only known since like four years or five years or something, to be also present in plants and cyanobacteria, and this is the enterodulose pathway. Um, under, under dark conditions, these pathways are there to break down carbohydrates and yield ATP and reduction equivalents, and then of course also intermediates for the synthesis of all these amino acids that you see here, and, and also of course for ribose as for, for DNA and, and RNA. What is important that um, in, in darkness, of course, photosynthesis and calvin benz cycle are not running. However, in the light, um, when, when they are active, then the ATP and then and the NADPH that is uh, yielded from glycolytic roots in darkness can, can be yielded from the light reaction of photosynthesis. And all these intermediates that you see here um, are actually provided by the calvin benz cycle of, of CO2 fixation. So we were interested to know under which conditions um, which of these uh, routes are actually of importance. So what we did, we made a lot of um, deletion mutants. So we knocked out key enzymes of the different pathways. So in order to interrupt the OPP pathway, we knocked out either ZDF or GND. In order to knock out uh, the EMP pathway, we knocked out PFK. In order to knock out the ED pathway, we knocked out EDA. And then we analyzed these, these deletion mutants under different growth conditions. And what you can see here is the growth under food autotrophic conditions. And you can see that all mutants grow rather well. There's a slight uh, diminished growth in the mutant in which the ED pathway is knocked out. And um, this doesn't look so significant here, however, we actually analyzed a lot of mutant strains. And when we had a lot of repetitions, we saw that this difference is actually also significant. Then also under mixotropic conditions, it's again the Enhadudo pathway, which is most important, which means that under conditions when the calvin benz cycle is active, the ED pathway is, is the most important route. And we now look under, under dark conditions, so either under heterotrophic or fermentative conditions. So this is a condition when we have sugar, and, and darkness, and this is in the presence of oxygen and in the absence of oxygen, you can see that all the mutants in which the OPP pathway was deleted um, show the worst growth. And um, also the, the EMP pathway is of some importance, but the endodrop pathway definitely doesn't play a role here. Under fermentative conditions, we didn't really measure the growth because cells do not grow very well. Um, they rather, rather survive. So what we did, we kept them, them under dark anaerobic conditions for a while. And then on day seven, we turned the light off and then we on, and then we checked um, how, how they could uh, resume growth again. And you can see here that again, um, the Enhadurov pathway is not of importance and also the EMP pathway is not of importance. But if either that we have or GND were knocked out, we have mutants that had problems to resume growth again. So this means in, 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 under dark conditions, when the calvin benzen is inactive, then really the OPP pathway is, is, of, of, is most important. 
And um, this makes perfect sense actually because all those in the intermediates that are um, provided by the calvin benz cycle in the light can actually be provided um, by the, this oxidative pentose phosphate pathway and, and also lower glycolysis in, in darkness and especially also ribosis for to make RNA and DNA um, are only provided by the OPP pathway. So it makes sense that this pathway is of importance in, in darkness. Um, okay, so but now to think about under which conditions these glycolytic routes do play a role, it's it's in some way um, easy to understand that they are um, that they are important under fermentative conditions because no photosynthesis is the photosynthesis is not not active and you have an organic mm -hmm. carbon source. So under these conditions, um, of course, it helps to break down carbohydrates. The same is also true under heterotrophic conditions. And under mixotropic conditions, photosynthesis is running, but you have an organic carbon source in addition. So you have both CO2 fixation, but you can, but cells can enhance their growth um, by utilizing this carbohydrate. It of course also makes sense that these roots do play a role. However, the question is um, how the situation is under, under photoautotrophic conditions. And um, what we found is that the ED pathway, if this is deleted, um, we found a diminished growth. It was not a big effect, but it was truly significant. However, when we now made double mutants, so when we knocked out um, the ED pathway in addition to either a PFK or ZVF or GND, we got mutants that really grew worse under photoautotrophic conditions. And it's important to know that these are conditions um, under continuous light. Um, and what, what you can see here is that especially the EDA gene D mutant, so the mutant in which the ED pathway and the OPP pathway were knocked out, that these mutants really had problems to grow under these conditions. Um, now there's one thing that um, what, what we hypothesize is that it could of course be that this uh, phosphogluconate, um, which is that this might accumulate when these both pathways are knocked out. And we checked this and really found um, that 6 phosphogluconate was accumulating in this either gene D mutant here. And um, it is known that 6 phosphogluconate is an activator of Rubisco under, under conditions and low con concentrations, but if it accumulates at high concentrations, it's actually um, inhibiting Rubisco. So we therefore checked also the CO2 assimilation rate, and you can see here that in the mutant, um, this CO2 assimilation rate is, is, um, is reduced. Um, but we still wondered, um, I mean, this still doesn't give an answer why, why glycolytic roots are of importance under these conditions, because in some ways, of course, counterintuitive at first sight, because the light reactions of photosynthesis provides ATP and NADPH, and the calvin benz cycle provides really all intermediates that um, are otherwise provided by the glycolytic roots. Um, so yeah, we were still wondering why these, these roots were required for optimal photoautotrophic growth. And now if you look um, at these different pathways, so if you look at the Calvin-Benson cycle and at the EMP pathway, um, you can see that there are a lot of reactions that are shared by both pathways. And um, there are also a lot of intermediates that are shared by both, both pathways. Um, obviously the pathways of course operate in, in opposing, uh, opposing directions So the Calvin-Benson cycle is of course there to build up carbohydrates, whereas the glycolytic roots um, are there to, to break down carbohydrates. So what we did, um, if you put these both pathways on top of each other, you can see um, even better um, the, the overlapping reactions. And you can see that if the calvin benz cycle is running or is active under photoautotrophic conditions, um, it will interfere with the OPP pathway as, as it, at this step here. And um, it will also interfere with the ED pathway at this step and with the EMP pathway at this step here. Um, the only, the only um, pathway that's not, that doesn't share intermediates um, and reactions with the calvin benz cycle is actually the n hydro pathway. Um, so we wondered, could it be that the ED pathway is important under photoautotrophic conditions to facilitate glycogen break breakdown in parallel to, to CO2 fixation in the light? And for this, we, we checked for the glycogen content in all these glycolytic mutants, and we found um, indeed that only the EDA mutant accumulates much more glycogen in contrast uh, to, these, to these other mutants. Now, there are, of course, two possibilities why there's more, more um, glycogen in these cells. It could, of course, either be that they produce more glycogen, or it could be that glycogen breakdown is, is diminished in these, these mutants. And 
in order to tackle this, this um, we took different strains and then we put them first under photomixotrophic conditions because it's known that under photomixotrophic conditions, a lot of glycogen is accumulating. And then we brought them back either to light or to darkness under, under autotrophic conditions and checked how, how um, fast a glycogen was degraded in these different mutants. So, and the hypothesis was of course um, that in the EDA mutant, um, that glycogen degradation might be slower than in the other mutants um, in, in the light. And the results are shown here on this slide. So you see here um, two curves always. This is always glycogen breakdown after the transfer from either photomixotrophic um, conditions to heterotrophic conditions. Um, this is a black line and or to, to autotrophic conditions. Um, this is the, the light, um, this, this line here. And in the wild type, you see, so this is a breakdown in the light and in, in darkness in the wild type. If you now look at the PFK mutant where the EMP pathway is knocked out, this is both okay. Um, if if um, the OPP pathway is knocked out, you see it's expected the glycogen breakdown in, in darkness is really um, very low. And this of course fits also very well with the results um, from, from the gross experiments. And it's only in the either pathway, in the either mutant, um, the glycogen degradation also in the light was, was really uh, diminished. And this is also summarized in this slide here. So what you see here is also always the glycogen degradation in, in light and darkness. And you see again the wild type here, then the PFK mutant, then the OPP pathway mutants, and it's only the EDA mutant, um, where truly uh, glycogen degradation in, in light is diminished. So from this, it, it looks as if um, in the absence of, of the ED pathway, um, that this really decelerates um, glycogen breakdown down in, in the light. Um, now, um, this of course still doesn't explain why glycolytic groups are of importance under phototrophic conditions, because the question is of course, why is any way glycogen breakdown required in, in continuous light? And um, in order to check this, we, we kind of wanted to double check how homogeneous actually the right light regime um, was in our cultivation tubes. Um, so this is how we cultivate our cells. You can see here the, the photobioreactors. So we have these kinesia tubes. They are bubbled um, with ambient air continuously so that they are also mixed all the time. And then they are illuminated from two sides. So from this and from this side. And so what we checked is the, the light, uh, light intensity is distribution. You can see that in the center of the cell of, of the tubes, of course, it's darker than outside because there is a shading from the cells on each other. And, um, and then OD value from, from 1.6, you still have like 20% here in the middle, but at an OD value of 4.4, of it gets really extremely dark here. And if you now think of a, a single cell, um, this is of course kind of swirled around here in these tubes. So it's sometimes here in the center and sometimes it's here outside in the tubes. Um, which means that a single cell really encounters very heterogeneous light conditions, um, also under photoautotrophic conditions in continuous light. And um, so these situations kind of rather resemble natural photoautotrophic conditions, but they are certainly also do not meet requirements for, for classical um, flux analysis. And um, so we wondered, of course, could it be that these glycolytic groups are only important under these conditions? Because as a, due to this short period that they sometimes might be um, in the, the short dark period that they might um, have when they are in the center of the tubes. So for this, we also made different gross um, experiments. Um, so this was done in the, the group of uh, Christoph Wittmann in Saarbrücken. So they, because they also um, made flux analysis with our mutants. And um, so they took shaking flask where the light regime was more hom homogeneous. And, so they kind of now met um, the requirements for flux analysis, but actually also under these conditions, the EDA gene D mutant grew really worse than, than the wild type, which means that it's not only the short, uh, short dark period uh, which um, makes these glycolytic groups so, so important. Um, what was in, interesting is first of all that this gross impairment prevailed under these conditions, but also this, the accumulation of 6-phosphoglucanate couldn't be observed under these conditions. And, um, this of course either indicates that there is no flux or it indicates that in the in this mutant fluxes have been rerouted or it could also be um yeah we of course cannot cannot um rule out also that 
that either or gene D might also have, have um, moonlight functions. But what is important is that um, this, this pathway or the, the growth impairment here cannot really be explained um, by the fluxes that, that might be found under these conditions. And um, this is something that, that I personally really learned a lot from, from these studies um, that, I mean, flux and growth analysis, they really can sometimes eventuate in contradictory results, but really without being wrong. And um, so, and I think one, one limitation um, of flux analysis, of course, you always have to have these steady state conditions and you only get a, sh a short snapshot um, of a situation. And this is, of course, in some way highly artificial. Um, which means um, that if you have flux analysis and there is there is an absence of a flux through a pathway, this doesn't really have to mean that this pathway is not, not of importance. And this is um, what you can see here in, in this picture, because there are certain groups that made flux analysis under photonic exotropic conditions. And first of all, the Enhedura pathway was of course, of course not considered, um, but there's an, a work from 2017 and they found that the flux through the ED pathway is actually not really present under photonic conditions. Anyway, if you look at the growth um, of our mutants, you can see that under photonic exotropic conditions, um, a mutant in which the ED pathway is deleted really does have a phenotype. So this means, on the other hand, that if you have a diminished growth of a mutant, this also doesn't automat automatically mean that, that there was really a strong flux through this deleted pathway. Okay, but now the question is now why why do we have these strong phenotypes anyway and these EDM mutants? And there's one one hypothesis that that came then up to our mind, and this was we wondered whether this glycolytic key enzymes whether they might kind of form be part of glycolytic shunts in in instead of complete roots in the light that replenish this Calvin Benson cycle kind of as as anaplerotic reactions in a, in a heterogeneous light regime. So we wanted to test this next. Um, well, this is first also to explain the hypothesis in more detail. So, I mean, this is kind of the, the classic view of the calvin benz cycle. So if you have three rounds of CO2 fixation, then you will get, um, you can always drain off one triose phosphate and three, uh, three triose phosphates are kind of required in order to regenerate um, ribulose biphosphate, right? This is kind of the classical situation. Um, now it could of course be if, for example, if you have fluctuating light, light conditions or if some intermediates are drained off a lot, um, that it might be helpful if you can kind of tap, for example, the, the glycogen pool. And you could either do this by the so-called OPP shunt. Um, so if you start with three molecules of glucose 6-phosphate here, you could just decarboxylate them and then, then you would end up with three molecules of ribulose 5-phosphate. Alternatively, of course, you could also um, combine this PGI shunt with the ED shunt, um, because this would yield, if you again start with three molecules of glucose 6-phosphate, this was, would yield uh, two molecules of fructose 6-phosphate and then one GAP, and then you could also combine them and again end up with, with um, three um, molecules of, of ribulose 5-phosphate. And of course, dependent upon which of these pathways you use, of course, the yield or, um, or from NADPH and, and ATP and so on will be very different. So this might be also be a way to fine tune metabolism. So if you have, um, yeah, if, if you want to, to balance some, some, um, some intermediates or so. Um, so we tested this hypothesis um, by measuring photochemical growth sense quenching. And I would like to explain this here on this slide, um, this picture here. So under dark conditions, obviously there's no water splitting um, and the Kelvin band cycle is, is inactive. Um, now, if you shine light on these cells, um, then the splitting of water will start immediately. So you will you will have an, ele an, an photosynthetic electron transport here, whereas the calvin benson cycle is at the beginning still inactive, um, which results in fluorescence um, at photosystem two. Now, when the calvin benson cycle then gets activated, it will quench this fluorescence. And this is what you can see here. So this is here the wild type. So first um, you have a fluorescence so there's no fluorescence or, or little fluorescence quenching. There is fluorescence, and then you see the quenching of the fluorescence in the wild type here in this curve. We added um, glucoaldehyde to the cells, and this is shown here. And if you add this, it's an inhibitor of, of the calvin benz cycle, um, then you do not see this fluorescence quenching here. So this, this system, we had a good way to see how an arrested calvin benz cycle can be reactivated again. Um, 
so we, we checked this um, in our different newtons. And our idea was the following. So there are some enzymes that are part of glycolytic shunts and some are not. Um, so for example, PFK um, is not really part of this shunt because the flux would go this way. This is also the reason why, why we didn't call this EMP shunt, but PGI shunt because this is the enzyme which is involved. So our hypothesis was um, that that's this, this mutant wouldn't have problems to, to reactivate an, an, an arrested Kardin-Benson cycle. Um, Whereas the hypothesis was that if we either knock out ZBF or GND or either, they might have uh, problems to reactivate it again. And we also investigated a mutant in which um, an enzyme was knocked out so the glycogen can no longer be broken down. And this was because we were interested to see if this process depends on glycogen or not. Um, so the results are, are shown here. So here again, you have the wild type and, and the control. And always in black, you have the wild type, which quenches um, the first sense. Um, and you can see here that if PFK is not out, there's no effect as we had expected. However, if, if either ZVF is not out um, or GND or, or um, GND or EDA, you really see that, um, that this is decelerated, the reactivation of the calvin Benz cycle. And also when the enzyme is not out so that glycogen cannot be used to catabolize any longer, uh, the reactivation is also um, much slower or decelerated. Um, so this kind of shows that glycolytic roots indeed form an aphlerotic chance to re replenish the carbon benzene cycle in, in transition states in cyanobacteria. So it's, it looks as if these glycolytic roots kind of have a dual function. So um, the idea is that they, they operate as, as full um, roots in, in darkness for carbohydrate break breakdown but that in the light, um, they have this function to, to um, replenish the current band cycle and, and to fine tune it. So it seems that there's really kind of an, an delicate interplay between um, anabolic and, and, hetero and, and a catabolic um, uh, uh, processes in the, in the cell. So to summarize this, um, is that first of all, flux and growth analysis, as I showed, of deletion mutants can really eventuate in very contradictory Results be, be, without being wrong, and I think it's just important, um, yeah, to to have in mind that both approaches, of course, give very valuable insights, but they really both have their limitations. And I think it's yeah, it's, it's just important um, to have to keep this in mind. And then um, I hope I could convince you that these glycolytic roots seem to have a dual function. So there's this carbohydrate carbohydrate breakdown in, in darkness, and in the light, um, they replenish and fine tune the carbon dense side actually, which means that to regard the carbon benson cycle as an exclusively autonomous cycle is, is really an, an oversimplification. So rather in line with other autocatalytic auto cycles, it is as, as well also regulated by anaplerotic reactions. Okay, so with this, I would like to thank the, all those who contributed to this work. This was my, mainly Alexander Markovka, but also Lars Michelmann, Katharina Springler, Sarah Hildebrandt, uh, Jona Kalib and Marius Teuner. And then um, our, our cooperation partners in, in the University of Saarbrücken, which is um, Christoph Wittmann and Dennis Schulze, and then Karl Paul Schammer from the University of Tübingen. And I thank you for your attention, and now I'm open for your questions.